Amen. Amen. Thank you, Crystal. Church, can we stand together this morning as we worship the Lord in music and the word?
abounds in deepest waters, your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you never failed and you won't start now. And I That we're yours. Lord, thank you that your forgiveness 
And your mercy has come to us, your people, called by your name, called out of darkness into your glorious light. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your mercy that extends every day, renewing our minds, healing our hearts, letting us be yours. And you become ours. We identify as the followers of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we can identify, that we can call upon your name. And know that the God of the ever-expanding universe comes to us, to be with us, to talk with us, to encourage us and heal us, to bring us to peace and comfort. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence in this place today. As we look into the scriptures today, would you teach us? Would you train us and would you give us the ability to take steps towards you out of faith and hope and love into your presence today? And Lord, today as your people called by your name, Lord, today as this week has unfolded, we ask for the peace in Jerusalem. We ask for peace in the Middle East, that the Muslim and the Christians and the Jewish Lord, that they would come together in peace. Peace only comes at your hand truly, Lord Jesus. Today we ask for there to be peace, that you would work your miracle in that region. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Be with us today. Teach us today. Draw us close to yourself today as we are declared by you to be yours. Thank you, Lord Jesus, we pray. In your mighty name, amen. And amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you, music team. A new member to the team. Sam on bass. This is his first day. Dave said he was pretty good, and I always believe what Dave says. I come in this morning, and this guy's tearing it up with arpeggios and that means he's playing his scales. That means he's legit. So, Sam, thanks for being legit, buddy. We appreciate you being here and worship, leading us in worship this morning in music. Would you grab your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter? So we are just finishing up last week and the week before on our series through Judges. So we're just finishing up on the Judges. Uh, we, if you notice, we skipped the last couple of chapters there in Judges. I don't know if you've ever looked at Judges, but those last couple of chapters are uh, rated M for mature um, at its very kindest. Uh, so I was like, you know, there's kids in service. I think I'm just going to leave the Judges for you to read on your own. And if you have questions, you can come ask me later. Uh, if you're with us online, which it looks like you are now, thank you for your patience today, and thank all of you for your patience today. Everything that could have gone wrong with our computers did go wrong this morning. So it's just one of those things where you're like, wow. I sit on the, locally I sit on the school site council at the high school, and uh, if ever you've wondered what's happening and what's going to happen with our schooling, uh, our internet isn't awesome up here, so it has been a challenge for Spectrum on all kinds of levels, on schooling and Zooming and kids getting to, to study together on Zoom, and then even for us at the church, one little hiccup and poof, everything kind of goes a little haywire. So thank you for your continued patience with us today, as now we're moving into, and we will stay in First and Second Peter until we get to Christmas. Really, Pastor? Yeah, thanks, Adam. He, he said, wow. <laughs> it's like, you can make it do that? I, can, I don't know if I can, but I know the Scripture's there, and it's going to be good, and we're going to celebrate together First and Second Peter. So would you turn with me to First and Second Peter? This is encouraging those who suffer. And so, you know, when you start a new section and passages in Scripture, there's always a good idea to kind of explain what we do, why we do it, why I do things the way I do. So if you're like, Pastor, you just finished up in Judges. I didn't even know there was a book in the Bible named Judges. I was like, exactly. That's why I teach from it. Uh, if you take a look at your Bible, it's kind of a big book. Hi, Martha. How are you? I am very glad to see you. You survived. So did I. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you get it. <laughs> 
Martha hasn't been in church, what, two years almost? One year for sure. Yeah, it's, it's a long time, all kinds of things. Anyway, to the Bible. Sorry. Hi, Martha. Everybody else is like, Pastor, you never welcomed me. Okay. Richard and Joy, it's good to have you in church today. Our pastor, Richard, who's our executive pastor, and his wife, Joy, are with us today. You had a whole bunch of grandkids graduate college, didn't you? I think I had two grandkids graduate college. Wow. It's more than me. Everybody else. It's good to see you, too. But those extra special guests who we haven't seen in a long time, we're glad you're here. Okay, so Bible. Why do I preach the way I preach? Well, if you've noticed, if you've been here a while, you can see that there are some patterns that I will kind of, you know, will take us through a gospel, and then I'll take us to the Old Testament. So this part, like this much of your Bible, is the Old Testament. When when Paul writes Timothy and says, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, he's talking about this much. And so I like to make sure that I take us through passages and chapters and books in the Old Testament, and then I'll take us to a gospel, or I'll take us to an epistle, which is where we are today. So First and Second Peter is an epistle. That is a letter that is written to the church. So this portion, this church, is in Turkey. So Peter is writing to the church in Turkey in this section from jail. Peter has been arrested, he's been put in jail, and so he can't go to the churches that are established throughout Turkey, so he writes letters to them. It's a really good idea, I think. If you get locked up in jail, start writing letters to people and writing letters to the churches so that you know. So if you're following along at home and online, and if you're here with us today, it's really important for me to use the breadth of Scripture, that to just hang out in the New Testament doesn't actually teach us the whole part of Scripture, all of who God is. So we really do need to go into the Old Testament and look through Genesis and look through Judges and look in some of those hard passages that it's like, I have never even read that before, Pastor. I know. And that's why I wrote a Bible study to go with it every week. There's a Bible study? There is. If you're not getting the Bible study, there's a couple of things that are probably happening. One, it could be that you're not online. Two, it probably is because you don't know that we have a website at 29church.org. It may also mean that you haven't filled out one of these blue cards for us, and we don't have your email because we will email you the Bible study. In fact, we email a newsletter every week to tell you what's going to happen in church, to tell you what the Bible study is so that you can work. So the Bible study this week will go with 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Is that enough of a commercial? Are you bored yet? Yes, Pastor, we are. Can you please continue? No problem. So encouraging those who suffer in the epistle, the letter of First Peter, it's written to a suffering church, to the Israelites who have become followers of Jesus and have had to flee Jerusalem, have had to flee Israel, and have moved into Turkey and are fleeing from the oppression that is happening in Rome. So other parts of the ancient world, Peter's in jail. And he's writing to encourage the churches. How many of you know if, if your leader or the person that you are following is deposed, gets in trouble, gets fired, it kind of makes your life a little uneasy. If your manager at work, especially a manager who you like, suddenly is gone, work becomes pretty unstable. Church is the same way. If suddenly the pastor is gone, you're like, wait, what has happened? Even if he's on vacation, it's like, well, this isn't right. This isn't church. How are we supposed to have church of pastors gone? You've never felt that way. Okay. <laughs> All right, I see how this is. That means I get to take more vacations. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> if your leader is deposed, if your leader is out of sorts and you don't know where he is, well, it's good to get a letter. And that's what Peter is doing. He's writing a letter to the churches in Turkey. He's writing to the Jewish believers in that area to be encouraged. He's writing from Rome. And Rome has taken offense against Christians. Particularly at this time, most Christians are Jewish believers. They're uh, Israelites who have come to follow Jesus. And Rome has had offense with them. Rome doesn't like the Christians. In fact, 
They're called the Christ ones as the orders are given through Rome to take out the Christians. Wait a minute, take out the Christians? Yeah. To persecute the people who are followers of Jesus at that time. So Jesus has died, been resurrected, and went to the right hand of the Father. And now his followers have had to flee Jerusalem. And they're all, all over the ancient world. You ready for the $50 uh, seminary word? The $50 seminary word is they are now called the diaspora. Ooh, thank you, Pastor. I will never use that word again. You're welcome. The diaspora are the Jewish believers who have left Jerusalem and are now throughout Turkey, into Asia, and into Europe. They're moving away, and they're trying to find safety because Rome has decided to persecute the church. What does it mean to be a persecuted church? Now, through the pandemic and all of this stuff, that I did hear a persecuted church. On occasion, there, there was a news or, or there was something on Facebook or whatever, and I have a good friend who's from the Middle East. And he talked about it. He is like, United States, I love you. You're not a persecuted church. I was like, what? Not a persecuted church. Well, what is a persecuted church? And so he defined it. He said, you know, I came to the United States to go to seminary so that I could study and then go back to my country and teach. While I was gone, my uncle, who was the pastor of our church, was killed. He was hanged in the middle of the city, currently, like within the last few years while this guy was in seminary and learning. Persecuted church, for the persecuted church, the church that Peter is writing to is a church full of people who have had their homes taken from them, who have had their leaders and their family members beaten, jailed, and even killed for the cause of Christ. So when we're talking about what's happening in this, Peter is writing to a group of people who are running for their life. So this is what happens. They decide, I've decided to follow Jesus. That means I could die. Not like the United States of America. Not even close. The believers that Peter is writing to, I've decided to follow Jesus and I understand I could die. Those two things were synonymous for the people who are reading this book. So as we're going to work our way through 1 Peter, we have to understand that these Jewish believers, that the folks who are hearing this letter be read in church, when they hear it be read, it's not just, hey guys, let's do better. You know, it's not coaching from the side that, hey, you know what, you can be better, you can grow stronger. No, no, I've decided to follow Jesus and I could die and I am good with that. That's a big deal. That's the believers that Peter is writing to. So as we work through this to understand that this is a big deal, that they are being persecuted by Rome, particularly the emperor. Now, if you're like most of us, especially if you're younger, when I say the emperor, you think of Star Wars, <laughs> right? Because that's the only other place where you hear the word emperor, right? You don't think, oh, yes, that's what they were talking about with Caesar Nero in the Bible. No, no. I say emperor, you think of, <laughs> right? That's what you think, unless you've never seen Star Wars, which we've had an entire pandemic. You could have easily watched all of the Star Wars movies. So I have no mercy on you at all. I'm going to make Star Wars references, and you're going to have to deal with it. So not that emperor, but not unlike that emperor. Nero hated Christians. Nero hated Christians because they refused to honor him. They refused to bow down to worship him. They wouldn't acknowledge him as king. There's only one king for them. His name is Jesus. So in Rome, when, when Caesar Nero finds out that these Christ ones, these Christ followers, these people of the way are not bowing down to worship, he's like, well, let's take care of those guys because he's the emperor. <laughs> he can take them out. He can just take them out. And so that's what he does. He has the power to oppress. 
He has the power to remove them from wherever they are in position, in leadership, in synagogues, in hidden churches. He can eliminate people. He can eliminate a person. Just like today, and my friend's uncle could be eliminated. That's what it means to be a persecuted church. They threaten your personal safety. They threaten your home, your children, your your physical life. They can make you fear for your life or flee for your life. You become a persecuted church. This letter is from the Apostle Peter to encourage those who are suffering at the hands of Rome. He is an encourager. He is telling them not to worry. You've decided to follow Jesus. You're okay with dying. Yeah, that's where we are right now, but be encouraged and let me tell you why. Let me tell you how you can be encouraged. Let me write to you and tell you. Peter, he is the apostle. He's one of the 12. The first one that Jesus really gave direction to. But his name isn't actually Peter. His name that he got from his mom and dad is Simon. If you read in the Gospels, you read about Simon Peter. That's the guy who writes this. Peter is actually his nickname. It's not his given name. It's his nickname. But in his nickname, he gets the name that Jesus gave him. Yep, that's the one I would use. Jesus gives me a nickname? Yep. In Aramaic, it's Cephas. Sometimes when I'm sitting in my office and I'm writing and, and putting these things down, you know, Peter gets, Simon gets a nickname. He gets the nickname Peter. And I would think about it, you know, what, what nickname would Jesus give me? Oh, it probably wouldn't be that good. <laughs> you know, moving here from Milwaukee, living in Lancaster, which was a desert, and then moving to 29, which is basically the opposite of Milwaukee. What nickname would I get from Jesus? Maybe I would be the melted one. You know, maybe I'd be sweaty palms, you know. What would, what would Jesus, maybe I would just be sweaty, you know, just, just sweaty. Because that's pretty much what happens. You move from where you get here and it's like, wow, it's hot. How is it all of you live here? And then you go to another place and it's even hotter. It's like, wow, holy smoke. Maybe it'd be sandblasted. That might have happened because, well, I ride a motorcycle. And, you know, when you're driving in a car, you may have, maybe you don't drive a motorcycle, but if you're in a car and, you know, you're driving down the 62, which we all have to do, you see those little dust devils out in the dirt? You ever see them up close and they start to come near the road? Have you ever seen that happen? Yeah, it's, n- it's not so bad in your car. If you're on a motorcycle... And you see one of those guys coming to the road, you're like, no, 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 faster, faster, faster. No, 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 oh, Jesus. You know what's in those things? Dirt, cacti, tumbleweed. Oh, my goodness. I think maybe I'd be called sandblasted. Burnt neck. Notice I didn't say che- redneck. Just, just burnt neck. Maybe cheese-hearted. That's probably the one that would stick. That'd be the, there'd be the first and second cheese-hearted. That'd be terrible. What, what kind of nickname would you get from Jesus? This guy, he gets a name that becomes books in our scripture. And he doesn't get the macho man Randy Savage. He doesn't get the ultimate warrior. I'm speaking to my people right now who are eight years old watching the WWF. It was called the WWF back then. He didn't get the name Hulk Hogan. No, no. He got the rock. That's the name that Jesus gave this guy. He called him the rock. And in this section, as we go through till Christmas, are you going to smell what Peter is cooking? Thank you. See, it worked better in the second service. First service was like... What? Man. Maybe it just came out better this time. You know, smell what Peter is cooking up for those of the believers who are listening to these letters being read in their presence. Peter was the apostle with authority. He was the top 
dog. He was the guy. They called him Peter. That was his name. That was the name that Jesus gave him, and everybody called him by that name. He was the pastor. He was the apostle. He was the man. It was funny. I was talking with, uh, with my assistant, uh, Haley, who was the lady in charge of Children's Church with her mom. And her son was telling her who I am. And she, he was saying, he was probably five. No, mom, his name is Pastor. No, his name is John. We call him Pastor. No, mom, his name is Pastor. So the next time he's in church, he comes into church and he comes into my office. It's during the week. He comes in. And he just stops in the door and he goes, what's your name? I was like, what do you mean, what's my name? He goes, what's your name? I said, my name is John. No, it's not. <laughs> I was like, are you sure? He goes, yep, your name is Pastor. Tell my mom. And he runs. <laughs> I was like, all right, brother, my name is Pastor. That's my name. But it's like that with Peter. It's like, well, that's not my name, but that's my name. That's for him. That's my name. I am pastor. Thanks, Blake. In fact, <laughs> even outside, somebody asked their kid. He's 5'2". They're like, hey, Caleb, what's this guy's name? Pastor. That's my name. So in case you're wondering, I actually do have a name. It's on the name tag, but those guys can't read, so they don't know. This guy was chosen and told to be the leader by Jesus. He is the head of the church. He is the rock. He is the man when he writes a letter, the whole church needs to listen and understand. He is the leader. He's the guy. This is Peter. So as we work through certain first and second Peter, listen like he is the guy. So would you turn with me? To 1 Peter, so in case you were wondering, because usually I read the scripture right at the beginning, right? Today I need to do the lead in to, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to talk about, here's who we're listening to. So we're going to go to 1 Peter, and we're only going to do the first two verses, because they are jam-packed as Peter recognizes who he's talking to. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and His Spirit has made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed Him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. <sighs> Isn't that good? I mean, can you imagine if, if every, every Sunday I came up and instead of taking us straight to Scripture, I just went, may God give you more and more grace and peace. Maybe that's a new way to start. Maybe that's a new way to begin preaching. It's like, hey, y'all, just one second real quick. May God give you more and more grace and peace. Alleluia. Imagine if you told yourself that every morning. God, would you give me more and more grace and peace? Maybe Facebook wouldn't be so ugly. If Facebook isn't ugly for you sometimes, it's probably because you block so many people. <laughs> Nothing's showing up on your thing but cat videos. Nothing against cat videos. I love a good cat video. I was thinking about making one myself. Tape my cat. <laughs> I am online, so so usually in the second service, <laughs> usually in the second service is where I divert just a little bit and tell a story that it's like, well, that doesn't need to be online, and we're in second service, so let's just enjoy each other here for a moment. But I can see the red light, so that means... So those of you online, let me just tell you what you're missing. 
So I was in my bedroom, and I was watching my cat. We have a cat. Her name is Ula. And Ula likes to get into our dresser. The drawers are not open. She stands up on her hind legs and grabs a hold of the handle and pulls it open, climbs into the drawer, and then disappears. Like tail and everything, and she's gone. And it's just one of those moments where you kind of stand there and go, what did our cat just do? I need to get that on a video. That's worth a million dollars. So I have a cat video. I might share it later. But not right now. <laughs> That's what you're missing, people. It's time to go back to church. <laughs> and in case you're wondering, that isn't a recording. Those are real people clapping their hands. <laughs> Say amen. amen. There we go. Get back to church. It's time. Get back to church. So here's what's happening. Peter's writing to a suffering people. And what does he say to those suffering people? What does he say to those people who are, who are oppressed, who are refugees in a country they don't know? What does he say to them? You are chosen people. God the Father chose you long ago. He didn't choose you yesterday. He chose you long ago. You are a chosen people, not by accident. Not because you happened to walk into a building and people said, hey, come on with us. No, no, you are a chosen people by the almighty creator of the ever-expanding universe. That's who you are. Don't ever think any less. That's who you are in Christ Jesus. You are a chosen people. If you are suffering today, I want you to have encouragement. God chose you. He chose you. You, not an accident. Peter writes it with two meanings. He writes it in two ways. One, he knows he's writing to the Jewish people. He knows he is writing to the Hebrews, Israelites. He knows that he's writing to them, but he also knows that other people are going to hear this letter. He understands that the people who hear this letter are going to understand that they are chosen by God. Israelites, and everybody else who's probably going to hear, because at this point he knows Paul's out there preaching to the Gentiles. You are chosen people, the children of Israel, who have come to believe in Jesus, and Peter is their apostle, as Paul is to the Gentiles, and they are strangers in a foreign land yet again. They have had to run away. And they're not just running because they want a new place to live. They're not running because they have an opportunity to go and settle somewhere. They're running for their very lives. And in a lot of ways, they're running as groups of people, groups of believers in Jesus, running together. Can you imagine if you had to run, if you had to get out of your hometown and go somewhere where you could be safer that you could run with a group of people, that you could run with your church. You didn't go by yourself. They didn't go by themselves. They went as a church. Gives a whole new meaning to church, doesn't it? There's a whole new understanding of what it means to do church together. To call someplace home? Today it's home welcome. There's a lot of things I notice when I walk into the sanctuary. That wasn't one of them today. <laughs> Strangers in foreign lands who go there as a church. This is the church that's running. And what does he say to them? Knew you and chose you long ago. And his spirit has made you holy. His spirit has made you holy. If you are suffering, be encouraged that today 
God makes you righteous. That's what Peter is saying to the church. It is God himself who makes you righteous. By the power of the Spirit, you are made righteous. Not in your own ability. Not in your own strength. In fact, your own sin and your bad decisions are gone, and now you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. It is what God does in you, not what you do for God. It's what God does in you, not what you do for God. That's right. Got a haircut this week. If you were in the first service, you already know what's coming. <laughs> Got a haircut this week, and so, you know, I'm getting a haircut. The lady's, you know, buzzing and everything, and... And eventually, you know, it always comes about, this is the second time I've got my hair cut there, always comes around, they ask, so, because they can tell I'm not a Marine, not a sailor, so what do you do? Well, that's going to change the trajectory of this haircut. Let me just tell you right now, I need you to understand what's going to happen. And she goes, what in the world do you do? I was like, well, you know, if I tell you, I have to kill you. <laughs> I said, well, I'm, I'm a local minister. The sign outside this place it points that direction. I'm pastor at First Assembly. Oh, really? And as she's cutting my hair, you know, whenever that happens, I'm always like, what's going to happen? Come on, I'm going to be online. Please don't mess this up for me, <laughs> you know? And she's cutting away, and, and all of a sudden... For us who are here, we understand where our righteousness comes from. We understand that it's not our ability. It's who He is for us. That He takes our sin and makes us new creatures with renewed minds and renewed hearts. But if you don't understand that, and then you meet a preacher who's sitting in your chair, it's like, oh man, what's going to happen? You know, you're going to get electrocuted or something. So she starts telling me about taking care of Mother Earth. Oh, well, that's good. You know, got to take care of the planet. You know, I always try to flip a little theology in there. It's like, well, yeah, if the Lord created us to take care of the planet. We are the earth keepers. That is our first job. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I take care of the earth. You know, I, I believe, you know, take care of it. You know, I feed the rabbits and, you know, I don't want to... I want to throw any garbage down, any, any food garbage down my sink, uh, so I throw it outside for the rabbits, because, you know, then the rabbits, then they, they feed the coyotes, and then the, the coyotes, you know, feed the carrion birds, and then, and then you didn't use carrion, but, you know, that's me, and, you know, they feed this, and then you got to feed the pigeons and all of that, and, and I was thinking to myself, so you're a good member of the earth because you throw your trash to the rabbits? That's the best you got? That's the best any of us got. Think about it. That's what Scripture says about us. Our very best. Our very best righteousness is just like filthy rags. Every time I think about that, I look at the rag after I'm done changing the oil, and it's like, this is the best I got when I stand before Jesus. Because it's not what I can do. It's what He does. Which, I'm all in favor. By all means, feed the rabbits. You feed the rabbits, feed the birds, you know, whatever, water the coyotes, they'll come around, they'll stick around if you do that, but, you know, whatever, I'm not against that. In fact, I think it's a good idea that we take care of the earth. But if we're going to talk about it, we're going to try to justify ourselves before God, we're empty-handed, worse than empty-handed, we're filthy-handed, unless Jesus so if you're suffering, be encouraged today. God has made you righteous. He has set you apart. He has sanctified you. And again, by the Spirit of God who brought you to faith in Jesus in the first place. We only can believe in Jesus because God has given us that ability to have the faith to believe so He can cleanse us. What? God is the one who brings us to Himself. He made the way, He does the cleanup, He does the faith work, He does the work so that we can be to, close to Him, so we can be called His children. That's how it works. He does the work. We get to be the beneficiaries. Why? Because you feed the rabbits? 
No. Because he loves you and he's decided to bring you in and you believe. He's decided. He made the way and you said, yes, I believe. And he's like, come on in. You're on my team now. And for those of us who are picked last for kickball, some of you are like, no, I was picked first. What are you talking about? Then this is not for you. For everybody else who was picked last for kickball, guess what? The captain is the Lord, and we're always picked first. You're picked first. You're picked first. You're picked first. You're picked first. To be on the Lord's team, you are picked first. His spirit is the one who brings us faith. His spirit is the one who cleanses us. Believing in Jesus as the Son of God comes because of what he has done. The truth of God, which brings about righteousness. You know, the Hebrews, they understood that. When Peter wrote this to them, that being cleansed by belief, by believing in Jesus, they already understood this. You turn with me to Genesis, real fast. Turn with me to Genesis, chapter 15, because they understood who Abraham is. Abraham is their father. Abraham's the first guy, the first believer. Listen to this. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abraham in a vision and said to him, Don't be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. But Abraham replied, O sovereign Lord, oh, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all of my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. And then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. And then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Exclamation point. Verse 6, this is the one. And Abram believed the Lord. And the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Counted him as righteous because of his faith. Righteous, that means in right standing with God. He is in right standing with God because of what he believes. As a result of believing in Jesus as the Christ, obedience to God is possible. It's possible. If you're suffering today, God is the one who brings you strength to obey the Lord. Not feeding rabbits. Not feeding rabbits. The strength to obey the Lord, the ability to please God only comes because you believe in Him. It is the power of God at work in you that allows you to obey the Lord. Otherwise, we just have dirty hands always. But when God comes in and He cleans us up, He takes away our sin, He gives us the ability to obey and to follow Him, it's because of Him. Sometimes I think we make this very complicated. Obedience is the result of faith. And could it be, if obedience is the result of faith, could it be that disobedience is lack of faith? Disobedience is the lack of faith. Dependence on your own righteousness and your own good deeds and your own positive action is actually a lack of faith. Being positive all the time because positive is going to come back to you if you're positive, that is not the gospel. That's you trying really hard for you to be able to say, good things come to me because I'm good. You're just feeding rabbits. Can you let that sink in? trying to save yourself by your own good deeds. You can't do it because you can never be good enough. We stand before a perfect and righteous God. We are fully dependent on the righteousness of God. But by faith, by faith, by believing Jesus and who He is, 
He gives us the righteousness we need. He gives us the strength to obey. He calls us his own, and we get to be chosen, and we get to walk in the power of God. The power of the almighty creator of the universe suddenly gets to be a part of who we are in this world. That's what we have decided to be as members of the body of Christ. Stop trying to do it on your own. Instead of doing it on your own, how about try, Lord, help me. Jesus, help me. Will you stand at the crossroad where you know you're about to make a bad decision? Jesus, help me. You've already made the bad decision, Jesus, forgive me. Because it's true, that's what happens. It's forgiveness. Is like that. We are fully dependent on the righteousness of God, which He gives us by faith, not by our works. He gives us by faith. Our sin, our offenses, our disobedience, our rebellion, our prides. That's who we are truly as human beings. When we believe in Jesus alone, we are made clean. We become right standing with God. We no longer need the law of obedience. We no longer have to do. We get to. There is no have to. We get to. And the law of love rules in our hearts. It is the love of God. The love that God himself puts in us that we now share. Not our righteousness, but his. Not our abilities, but his. Not how much we can love, but how much he loves us. Not what good we can do, but how good he is. It is a brain change. And I can feel for some of us, it's like, Pastor, it is time for lunch. You should have had a snack halfway through so we can get what you're talking about. Listening to the Holy Spirit and obeying. Walking in love. Following Jesus. Are you following Jesus? Have you decided to follow Jesus? I just told you all the benefits of following Jesus. Otherwise, you're out on your own. Do you? I'm not going to ask you, can you? Because you can't unless you do. To believe. To believe in Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Have you decided to follow Jesus? I want to encourage you today, most of the people who are sitting around you have decided to follow Jesus. They've made that decision because they know they can't do it on their own, so they have to trust Jesus. I want to encourage you today, it's time to trust Jesus and to believe who he is. Today, if you're like, yep, that's me today, Pastor, I need to follow Jesus. I need to follow him. Because everything you said, if that's true, this is a life-changing moment. You are absolutely right. This is a life-changing moment. Do you want to follow Jesus today? I want you to wave your hand at me. Everybody's got their eyes closed. But you need to tell God, it's time for me to follow you. Would you raise your hand with me in following Jesus? Is it time? Yeah? Yeah? I see those hands. Church, would, can we pray together out loud? Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again. So that I can be a child of God. I admit I'm a sinner. I'm disobedient. I don't love very much. And I've messed up my life. I need you. I commit to following you. And doing it your way. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For saving me. Amen. Today, if you prayed that prayer, which was a little bit backwards, that's the way Peter does it. He wants you to believe and then admit. Usually I say you have to admit and then believe. Peter says you got to believe, then admit. Because when you believe, that's when the power of God is at work. To believe, admit, commit. Today, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, Gospel of Luke says there is rejoicing in the presence and the, uh, rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God 
over one sinner who repents. One person who turns from their sin and decides to follow Jesus. So if that was you today, today, congratulations. You just blew up a party in heaven in the presence of the angels of God. Not too many people can say that they did that, but that's today. That's you. We want to celebrate with you. So if you have a chance at the end of service, tell me or tell one of the deacons or maybe one of the folks up front, I decided to follow Jesus today because we want to rejoice with you. Can we stand together this morning as we sing a closing song together?
a blessing for you today. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God give you his peace in your going out and in your coming in, in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labor, in your leisure, in your laughter, and in your tears. Until you come to stand before Jesus on that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Today I bless you as you go and fellowship with God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 God bless you. Wash your hands. Take care of yourself. Be healthy. We'll see you next week. Power.